Welcome to our third webinar in the Rethinks series. Um, the purpose of these webinars is really to rethink the way we do things in contact centers because contact centers have been around for many, many years. And we believe there are, it's time to rethink the way we do things. So this week, what we're rethinking is outbound contact centers. And just before we begin, there are a couple of maintenance things. Um, on the right hand side, you'll see a chat that you can engage with us. Any questions that you send to us, we will respond to you directly either during the webinar or after. And equally, if you're joining us for the the replay, if there's a link to the YouTube which allows you to forward and pause and stop the webinar at any point, which unfortunately the webinar jam link doesn't allow you to do. So if you want to skip anything, go to the YouTube link. So this week we are joined uh, by Rod Jones. Rod Jones is our regular here. He has over 40 years experience in the contact center industry. He's been a consultant both here in South Africa and in Africa. Welcome, Rod. That's been great. It's lovely to be here down in Cape Town with the Xilab team and looking forward to this webinar and sharing some experiences. And we're also joined by Nuruddin Ayub, who is the CEO of Xilab. Nur has been implementing solutions and creating solutions for over 20 years. And his last venture was being um, co-founder at All Mutual Finance. And during this time, he had a lot of experience implementing solutions in contact centers, which then eventually led to the inspiration for Xilab. So welcome, Nur. Thank you, Catherine. And you know, this is my first webinar, right? So yeah. I'm a little bit nervous. So okay. <laughs> and my name is Catherine Collins. I'm head of product here at Xilab. Okay, so let's just have a look at what we're going to be speaking about this week. Uh, as I mentioned, we're rethinking the outbound contact center space, and there are really three areas that we want to focus on. The first is we talk a lot about dialers in contact centers, but which, what type of dialer is appropriate to use in which environment? And when is a predictive dialer your friend, and when is it actually hurting your business? And the second one we want to speak about is blending. So blending, we don't mean eyeshadow blending, as was mentioned on our Twitter feed, by <laughs> there was some confusion there. We mean blending within the contact center. And really what we want to focus on here is why we believe a single waiting room or a universal queue, as some people might know it, is essential for blending. And then we're going to move on to a very exciting topic, which is AI. Uh, we're hearing lots about this in the media at the moment, and we want to share with you what our vision for AI in the contact center space is going to be. So Rod, why don't you kick us off uh, talking to us about dialers? Excellent. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you for uh, inviting me in on this webinar. Um, talk time the all important component of engaging with customers, engaging with the right customers, the right conversations, and hopefully rewarding outcomes from that. So talk time and can be equated to money, the cost of doing this. And so if we just look at the cost factors that go into any contact center, any uh, particularly an outbound environment, the physical environment, the physical space, data, purchasing data, cleaning data, analytics, etc., the technologies driving the operation, the management side of the uh, uh, operation, the carrier telco costs, and of course the labor costs. Now, all of this adds up to a significant amount um, per hour of operator time. And so if we start looking at this and breaking it down and saying, well, out of every hour, we need to get maximum productivity. Otherwise, the cost per minute or cost per, per, per inter interaction becomes exorbitant. So we, we first look at the efficiency loss drivers. We have actual time taken by agents to look up numbers, the dialing time, the ring time, engage tones, fax tones, out of order, um, encountering voicemail answering machines, etc. All of these reduce the amount of time that an agent is actually able to engage with a customer or a right party. So if we start off with the fundamental, the very basics of a manual dialing operation, and whether this is with a handset or on an on-screen dialing technologies. So as you can see there, between 14 and 16 minutes is the very best that we could hope for. But our operating overhead is still an hour the cost of that one hour. So eroding that efficiency uh, are the lookups, styling times, etc. So a mere 15, 20 minutes, uh, 15 to 16 minutes is the best we can look to in that. As the technology now starts uh, working for us a little bit more, we have a very ent entry-level dialing technology called preview dialing, where the customer record might be on the screen, but it's up to the agent to decide 
how long they look at that record before activating the dial. So uh, the agent lookups is the only component that we lose there and, and the rest of the efficiency loss drivers. So 16 to 18 minutes on a preview dialing system would be pretty good going in that space. As we start getting a little bit more sophisticated here, auto preview dialing, once again, the customer record is on the screen. The campaign manager would decide just how long that agent needs to preview that customer data before the system automatically dials it. So once again, a little bit more control over the pace at which the campaign is executed. And once again, those efficiency loss drivers there. So 18 to 20 minutes on a power dialing. Some environments might push that a little bit further, but uh, for purposes of these discussions, let's look at 20 minutes. As we move up, the next level on it is progressive dialing, and we'll revert a, a lot more to progressive dialing in these discussions a little later. So progressive dialing here, the database displaying the CRM information, customer information, um, pre-programmed to go into an auto dial very quickly. So all we have eroding our uh, productive time here, dialing time and ring time. So as you can see there, 20, 35 minutes of high intensity, right party connects hopefully, um, and pushing our efficiencies beyond that 30 minutes level. And then, of course, we get to the big daddy of the industry, predictive dialing. Now, predictive dialing, as you can see on the right-hand side there, takes care of number lookups. It takes care of um, detections of, of answering machines, engaged tones, out-of-order tones, etc. And in the hands of a good campaign manager and a dialer manager, pushing certainly well over 35 minutes, closer to 50 minutes, or even in some cases, even slightly higher than that. Um, but it's, it's the optimized um, efficiency in dialing is your predictive dialer. So if we, we take a look at that then uh, on the left-hand side there with predictive, yes, certainly large-scale operations has been the watchword for predictive, high numbers of ages, repetitive call types of a similar nature, uh, massive databases, predictive dialer burns numbers like it's going out of fashion. Um, highly complex integration issues, campaign management, need for high-end technical skills, not only in the configuration, but actually driving uh, this technology. Agent burnout can be a serious factor here as well. We're pushing agents to do it handled far too much productivity. So this is a high productivity, high efficiency environment. We always have to go back to that customer experience, the high quality engagement with customers, um, which predictive dialer does its job in certain environments. But I think the more we're moving towards the omni-channel, the multi-channel environment, where customers are demanding to engage with us across their chosen channel preferences. We have to be able to respond appropriately. I can't see predictive working in a multi-channel environment or in an omni-channel environment. So horses for courses, and I would certainly now support for the, particularly the smaller to medium-sized contact center, um, definitely a progressive dialer. I tend to agree with that actually. Uh, and obviously uh, pr there's other elements that determine if you should have predictive dollars because they don't always work in all the different campaigns. You know, each campaign has d different dynamics. Some of them need a lot of preparation. So therefore the predictive model becomes a little bit more uh, tricky. Totally agree with you. Okay, and this takes us quite nicely to our topic of blended contact centers, because uh, you've touched on it a bit there, saying that predictive dialers aren't necessarily relevant to a blended. But before we continue now, can you just take us through what we mean by blending? Okay. So the blending in, in traditional meaning is that an agent can do inbound and outbound calls, right? Uh, this is something that everybody wants. Everybody talks about blending, but in reality, very little organizations actually have truly implemented blending. And uh, excuses like, uh, you know, the agent is, doesn't have all the skills levels to do inbound and outbound are used. But in fact, it's not the true reason why blending hasn't been used. It's actually a technology reason. Um, and the queuing systems, the way we know it, where uh, people are all linked to a specific queue, a specific service, uh, al allows that everybody is scattered all over. It's very difficult to do actually blending in a true sense. 
Rod, has this been your experience? Uh, yes, it's certainly. In fact, I think the 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 fault is lie in lies with the an inability of technologies to actually handle it appropriately. But also, blending um, in the past has relied heavily on management, call center management, or campaign managers to almost physically switch groups and to switch routing uh, routing of calls, uh, whereas the uh, the new way of, of looking at a true blended environment, which I think is the solution that Zilab has come up with, with the single waiting room concept, which I'm sure you will expand on. So I get very excited about blending being a reality, probably the first time in 40 years of That's the of the industry. And, and, and actually, the, 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 the root cause of it is actually the cues, you know, and, and if you look at cues, the, the nature of it is, is almost like creating separate islands with different people. And at best, you've got the, the contact center manager or the team leader moving people from one queue to the other and trying to manage this so-called blending. But it becomes quite a, a tedious task and task. And in many things, uh, Catherine mentioned previously as well, is that that it takes minutes before actually a person moves from one to the other. And at best, at best, uh, some companies will have uh, agents sitting in, in multiple uh, queues to kind of simulate. The, the queues is actually the, the, the root cause, and that's why you need to go to a single waiting room. So maybe you could just elaborate a little bit on what that single waiting room is and why it's necessary for callbacks. Well, the, I mean, the, the easiest way to, to see it is, is just imagine you only have one queue, right? Uh, so all the interaction, regardless which channel, is it the voice, SMS, email, web chat, uh, social media, all arrives in one single waiting room. The, 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 sing, the waiting room or the, the single queue will then start prioritizing. Now it can start prioritizing between all the different interactions. Now, we always have this tendency to say that calls have a much higher SLA, right? You need to pick it up within X seconds, 20 seconds. But an email, we, we, we kind of say we can only reply, we should actually only reply with it within 12 hours, which could be true. But there are cases that, that an email could be even more important than, than, than a call. You know, if, if one of your customers, a big investors, most important customer in your organization, you want to actually give them a much higher SLA. In that case, you can only prioritize correctly if all your interactions are all sitting in one single waiting room. Yeah, and I think that's certainly becoming more true given that customer expectation of being responded to via channels like email and SMS is actually much shorter than what we anticipate. And often these emails get lost in inboxes, but it doesn't mean they're not as important as potentially a call with a lower business value. So I think, you know, the single waiting room concept, if we look at pure service level, I think most organizations have got that service level in telephony correct but then we have different service levels for the different channels but they operate in our individual silos so i'm seeing in the single waiting room concept we're actually able to look at total service level across all channels um, for optimizing the customer experience and having true blending Correct. This takes us to our next topic where we want to talk about AI. Now, this is an incredibly exciting uh, topic and you're certainly seeing it all over the media. And really, when you read about AI in contact centers, there's really two main areas that we are looking at. There's the sort of speech processing. So whether that's sentiment analytics or natural language processing or just speech recognition. And then there's also the use of bots. So before we talk about what our vision, our rethink for the AI in the contact center space is, we're just going to have a quick look look at where we are currently with those two pieces of technology and how they might benefit the contact center. So starting off with um, the speech. So you've got speech recognition, natural language processing, and sentiment analytics. And just to give you a quick understanding of what we mean by those, speech recognition is effectively the ability of a machine to interpret English language or human language into a machine readable format. So that might be text or whatever the case may be. Natural language processing is the machine's ability to actually understand what that text means, interprets it in an uh, artificial sense. And then sentiment analytics is the ability to interpret from that text what the sentiment of the individual is. So in other words, was he happy? Was he angry? Was he just plain neutral? So no, maybe what you could take us through now is how are these technologies being used in the contact center space currently today? Okay. Well, first, Catherine, um, there are, I still have to see 
uh, a proper sentiment analytic uh, process here in South Africa. It's used overseas much more, uh, but we, I'll elaborate why, because one of the, the biggest challenges is basically to have a uh, voice to text, you know, understand the, the, the South African accent is a little bit more challenging then because we haven't actually spent enough work to, to, to understand it. But if you look at this flow, you know, the client phones a, a contact center and then he can give an instruction instead of pressing one or two or three, you can just say, you know, uh, client services, and then he gets uh, routed to the agent that are performing those tasks. And then as they're speaking, the voice actually gets analyzed, you know, voice to text, and then uh, and then the voice to text, you can start doing some keyword spotting on it to find out that if you bad words are said or maybe some words like attorney or lawyer and and those things then get sent to the quality assessor to assess you know so rod how much of this is hype and how much of this is actually being implemented in a, an effective way well i think there's certainly a lot more deployments in happening in north america europe and of course australia is uh, very well advanced in this space as well but i think one of the things we're starting to see very definitely in our environment in southern africa is the use of voice <coughs> voice biometrics and uh, the use of biometrics for password verification, for example. We've seen several major deployments in mobile phone, in banking, etc. So that is definitely happening. So it is a leading edge technology. We're starting to see early deployments of it. The Analysis and sentiment, yeah, in-call sentiment, uh, yes, we've seen deployments in, once again, Europe and North America. It's probably very expensive at this point in time, but we will certainly be seeing this roll out. I see it over the next four to five years. And then, of course, I get really, really excited where analytics are, are using the speech analytics incredibly in South Africa today uh, for unpacking hundreds of thousands, if not millions of calls and, and extracting the business impact calls uh, for analytics and also for QA and then taking that back into the coaching environment. So uh, the, these technologies are very real, they're happening. And I think any contact center, at least planning the next five years, should take these into account as as very real features of the software of tomorrow. So one of the things that I always wonder about sentiment analytics, I mean, I know the barrier to entry for a lot of organizations is the cost involved, but certainly as you're seeing more competitors in the space, that cost is being driven down. But the other thing I always wonder about is is the accuracy, because you see stats going around of 70% accuracy, but that certainly, I'm convinced, is applicable to the European and American markets, where when we've done our own personal testing, we see that the accuracy is actually closer to 50%. That's correct, uh, Catherine. So we d we've done, uh, uh, actually, not only IBM Watson, we've tested a couple of others, where uh, when, we sp when we use a South African accent, it's actually quite difficult to get a very high accuracy. However, when we use the American accent and the UK accent, it was actually quite uh, uh, accurate, you know, some, depending which, which uh, uh, speech technology we used. Um, but in, in South Africa, unfortunately, it's still, still in, in its kids' feet. But, uh, but Rod, you, you have... Um, yes, no, Dean, um, over the last four to five years, there's been a huge amount of work being done by some of our academic institutions in developing the South African or African voice libraries, which obviously are, are very different to the American uh, or UK uh, voices. But I, I, I believe that the release of these libraries to the industry is imminent. So once again, leading edge technology, we've got a plan for it because it is a reality. And within the next few years, certainly uh, we will be seeing deployments using um, speech analytics. Absolutely. But from a Zyla perspective, we are implementing these things because obviously we're not only dealing in South Africa uh, and the technology is available in the moment when we have these libraries, then again, uh, everybody can start using it as well. And then the other topic which I'd just like to speak about before we get to our vision is the, the use of chatbots. So what we mean by the chatbot is effectively um, if you were chatting on a messenger type app like Facebook Messenger or web chat, uh, instead of there being a person on the other side, there's actually a computer and you may or may not be aware of this. And we see some scary stats from Gartner saying things like 85% of all customer service interactions will be using chatbots by 2020. But again, how much of this is really do bots stand today? I mean, are they actually useful in the contact center industry? And what do you think about that prediction, Rod? 
Well, I think we've got to look at the bigger picture here. That uh, first and foremost, I, I don't believe that by 2020, which is only 33 years away, uh, we're going to see massive swing towards automated um, services. Uh, bots certainly are a reality. They are uh, leading edge. They're starting to play a part. But I think we've got to look at the much bigger picture, the drive for, and the demand by customers for self-service. So certainly I see massive developments taking place in web portals, and mobile apps, um, FAQs, etc. And I think that's where bots to some extent will play a major role going forward. But I, I don't see it at 85%, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. um, going forward but it's something once again we need to plan for we need to put that on our uh, on our radar into our uh, architectures and our blueprints going forward but you must also understand that bots are uh, also dependent on the voice uh, voice to text you know as well you know so that it actually becomes really very powerful when using from from a voice perspective in a contact center so the one is it is, is dependent on the other as well uh, but when it comes to web chat and so forth it can be quite uh, effective specifically when it's actually very simple services so there is an, another area where uh, uh, bots can be used very effectively is for instance in ordering food you know ordering coffee you know which is not really a typically a contact center but in that mm -hmm. in that sense it will definitely grow quite substantially in that area I think also you know if we just relook at the timelines in my opinion not by 2020 but uh, 2025 going forward as AI develops, as the techniques develop, as the software develops. And of course, let's uh, not forget that the, the user experience, there are very few modern customers who actually can uh, feel comfortable engaging with AI. So um, we need to watch the developments in that space. So this really leads to the next topic, which is about explaining Xilab's vision for the artificial intelligence. And when we talk about artificial intelligence, we're not referring to bots and sentiment analytics, although certainly sentiment analytics will feed into our AI. What we really mean is a self-managing contact center. So no, maybe you could um, explain the vision of our artificial intelligence at Xilab. Yeah, the stuff that makes me very excited, you know, that's what makes us stand out, you know. Um, but the, the, the AI or machine learning will do a couple of things and the one probably one of the most important is actually to connect the customer with the right agent right um, and, and it will use two measurements for that which is one is customer satisfaction it wants to have a very high customer satisfaction and also wants to have a positive outcome you know so uh, in the case of a sale you would like that the sale being done and that the customer is very happy. And actually the, the, the AI will start learning and start learning to, uh, using a lot of attributes like age, sex, uh, uh, you know, what kind of server, et cetera, depending on the work item, it's gonna start determining who the right agent is. And I think a practical application for this might be, um, or I can see many, but one of the benefits I can see is if, you know, if you were running an outbound contact center, for example, and you had many different types of campaigns, those are all just different work items, mm -hmm. irrespective of channel or communication. And the AI is going to learn, okay, this agent's very good at this type of campaign, start serving more of this type of campaign to that agent. A beautiful example is uh, not, not every agent can can sell and collect. You know, a collection is a different, you need a different personality. So, and selling, you need a different personality. There are people that can do both, but uh, some of them can't. So, and the AI will start learning what is actually best, which work item also matches best with which agent. Okay, and then uh, what about the quality assessment? Okay, so the next component is the quality assessment. So now in the traditional form, quality assessment is done either randomly selected uh, of all the recording or they look at uh, things that are uh, times that are higher than average recording time. But we would like to have uh, approach it intelligently. So what will happen, for instance, in the case that a, a, a client survey will be put in a, ro a, a low client survey, then what happens, the, the retro recording will be sent to the quality assessors to assess, and the quality assessor will rate that, uh, that recording and feed that information back uh, to, the, to the AR. Uh, you know, like, for instance, the customer satisfaction is very low. That's how the AR will know that this specific customer with this specific agent, the rating was quite low. and and it learns out of that. So the, the QA, is, the, the quality assessment is very important from a from AI will select which one, but also feeding back into the AI so it can actually can learn. And it wouldn't just be selecting calls with a negative sentiment. It would be assessing all calls. It's just flagging anything that's gone wrong. It will take things in consideration that, that are out of the norm. You know, so for instance,
instance, if your average uh, for a specific service is, is 10 minutes and suddenly you've got a call it that took 20 minutes and it was a, a negative outcome, uh, then you would like to, to assess it and find out what, what actually... What's so in other wrong. words, be looking for all calls with some sort of a business impact, either positive or negative. That's right. So we want to take away the, the, the human element to select which, uh, which, which recording. In this case, the AI will start uh, identifying anomalies. Then the third one is a training. So the, 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 we want the customer satisfaction to be high and if agents are not performing well, the, uh, we will start, the AI will start sending training to them and where the agents will perform the training and the scores again feeds back to the AI. And through those scores, we will start identifying the strength of a specific agent. You know, So we, we are even things like he's very good in, in, in sales, you know, uh, not good in collection or is, 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 is types very well, you know, and that's the kind of stuff that the AI also needs to start to, to know more about the agent. The, the fourth component is workforce management. That is really to be able to, as an organization, to manage your, your contact center. In our case, uh, the, the, the machine learning will learn from the past and start determining uh, the capacity that you need to run your uh, contact center effectively to meet all your SLAs. In this case, we will have a seven-day forecast where it will show you how you know how, how many people you need. And then we also have an intraday. And intraday actually has intervals of 15 minutes showing you how many, how many people you will need to meet your SLAs. As people log on, the graph changes. And um, we wanted to take it to even a level further where the AI starts uh, uh, suggesting mitigation strategies. And mitigation strategy could be, for instance, uh, to switch off uh, outbound and, and only take uh, inbound calls because there is a, a high volume of inbound. Or you need to go and switch on more agents, home agent in this case, you know, that they can log on so they can actually handle all the interactions. I mean, it could be even something small like um, adding a message in the IVR or your flow to notify your customers that you're experiencing high call volumes. And obviously, the different mitigation strategies are applicable at different percentages. I mean, if you've got 5% increase in call volumes versus 50, your mitigation strategy is going to be different. Absolutely. Now, I get very excited to see this way, in fact, using technology to dynamically manage the flows within the contact center. And I think that graphic that you have on the screen there, um, that really excites me because that the omni-channel is a reality. It's happening. Um, and the growth is in that space there. And it's just, uh, I think the AI is going to simplify what would otherwise be almost an impossible environment to manage. Exactly. And in this, and by, by the, having the AI managing, it then allows you for the first time to truly have your agents be sitting anywhere, right? Because traditionally, we want them to be sitting on the same floor because we don't have technology that can help us to manage our floor. So in our case, the AI will start taking a lot of it. And like Catherine said earlier on, having a contact center solution that actually serves itself. And again, that's the first time that we can start really try to start talking about home agent in a true sense. Okay, if anyone has any questions about how our AI works, feel free to contact us. So just to, to sorry, Catherine, that, that I just want to close with this now. Um, if, if, we, if we look at the, 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 the previous slides, we spoke about uh, predictive dialer and then we spoke about a single waiting room and the AI. Now, if you look at predictive dialer, you start questioning if a predictive dialer is, is, is it the right thing, you know, because predictive dialer is all about quantity, right? It's about using as many minutes in an hour. But in our case, we would like to look at quality. Now, to be able to look at quality in each interaction, you need to have the single waiting room. You need to have artificial intelligence because without these things, you will never be able to really manage uh, uh, quality of your call. So the, the question to you, Rod, would you agree with me that rather go for quality instead of quantity? I think we've m certainly moved into that space where the customer experience has risen to the fore. And we need to address that. Whereas in the past, it's really been a volume-based production orientated. So the swing towards quality and the quality engagement with customers, the quality conversations, desirable outcomes, it has changed the dynamics of of campaign management and contact center management, both from an inbound and outbound yes. point of view. So um, going forward, I've, I firmly believe that uh, the solutions that you've developed here are in line with the global trends in this space. 
Thank you a lot. And thank you for listening, guys. Sorry that I have to close. I'm taking this over, but this is my, my first webinar and we had two technical clutches. Uh, but anyway, I'm still I'm still positive and I really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Okay, so thank you for joining us, Rodina. We also have a webinar coming up at the end of next, uh, middle of next month, which is all around rethinking customer experience in the contact center and why we believe it's so important to look at your customers' past journeys and consider that in something like routing um, in order to truly get customer experience. And then if you're still interested in Outbound, we're hosting a house Outbound event at our offices here in Cape Town, where we will be giving this presentation without any glitches. And we will also be having Jonathan Elcock, who will be joining us uh, to share his views on how to rethink the Outbound Contact Center space. Rod, thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much for the opportunity and look forward to uh, spending more time with Zylab.